Hello, this is Berkey Academy, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the circular flow diagram here. A way to visualize what is going on in an economy and how things might speed up and slow down as well. So in the circular flow diagram, the circular flow idea has to do with the green here, following the money. So I'm in the US, so I'm talking about dollars here. The money flows around the outside of the diagram, and the stuff, the real stuff that you can touch, you can see, flows around in red on the inside. And it talks about how a market is organized and how people are compensated for what they're doing. So. Up on top here in red we have the resource market. That's where people sell resources they have, their labor, their land, their entrepreneurial ability. Um, so households are selling these things in the resource market and these resources in red flow to the businesses where they can use the land and the things that come out of the land like timber uh, and the labor and the entrepreneurship and the capital capital meaning machines, buildings, things like this. So these resources are bought and sold in the resource market and businesses have to buy these things from households so they come from households and then businesses have to pay those households for the resources. Wages for labor, rent for land, interest for capital or borrowed money to buy machines. Um, and then um, profit is the return to entrepreneurship. Now those resources go to businesses where they use them to produce products and so businesses have to pay the money in the resource market that flows over to households. Now on the bottom side of this diagram we're looking at the product market. This is where the goods and the services produced by businesses are exchanged for money from households. So the goods and services come from the businesses into the market. People buy them and take them home to the households. The households give the money that they earned from selling the land or their timber or their talents. Um, they give the money in the product market to the businesses and that comes back to the businesses in what we call total revenue over here. So imagine you have an economy that's working very well. Um, businesses are producing products, they're selling products, people are working, everything's working well. One thing you can do with this model is that you can envision what would happen if all of a sudden the people in the households started to panic. Maybe we were worried about a coming disaster. Um, in my lifetime there have been several disasters people have predicted that didn't come true. There have been other disasters that have come true, such as 9-11. Um, suppose 9-11 happens and because of it we fear that things are going to go wrong. We fear a coming collapse of the economy or a coming collapse of our nation perhaps even. What could happen in this diagram that could go wrong? Well if I start to panic, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start saving money instead of spend it. I'm going to maybe even take my money out of the bank and bury it in the backyard. And so if I'm not spending my money, imagine what that could do to this flow of money for goods and services. That's going to slow down if, people, if everybody starts buying less of everything. Now, when that slows down, businesses are going to start earning less revenue. And the goods and services they're producing are going to start to pile up. When businesses have less revenue and what they're producing starts to pile up instead of being sold, what's going to happen? Well, businesses are going to need fewer resources. They're not going to need as many people. They're not going to need as many raw materials. And so money's going to stop flowing into the resource market as much, businesses will start to get worried that their sales are going down, they're going to start firing people, letting people go, and then less money will start going into paying for resources, and then households really do have something to worry about.
So you can use this model to see how household worry could actually become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because people were worried about a recession, they created a recession. So this this is one place where you know there's kind of an inter interaction between intersection and interaction between psychology and economics, uh, and you can visualize it with this um, circular flow diagram. Now this is a very simple version of a simple of a circular flow diagram. We could also make this circular flow diagram more um, complicated this way. So I've, add, I've added another player in the circular flow diagram. Here's government, and let's assume that the government can get involved because they can tax. So this blue arrow might be saying, well, they're going to take some of this wages, rent, interest, and profit that would be going to households, and they're going to take it as taxes. And then what's the government going to do with that money? Well, maybe they just give some of that money right back to the households in the form of welfare payments or unemployment compensation or social security. So they take some money, they give some money back. Um, maybe the government uh, takes some of that money and they uh, buy some things in the product market. So they send some money to the product market, they get some of these products like tanks and planes and buildings and cars and things like that. Um, they could also tax businesses, so we could add a direct business tax here that will come out of the business's costs, more money going to government. Um, this is getting a little bit into macroeconomics, but you can kind of see a little bit of the role that government can play in speeding up or slowing down an economy here. Um, suppose the government sees people start to panic, as I mentioned before. And people are so panicked, they're not buying anything, and they see that this is starting to slow down the economy. What could the government do? Well, what they could do is increase the amount of money that the government is giving to households. So they could increase unemployment compensation, pay it for a longer time if people are losing their jobs. They could send everybody a tax rebate. In the U.S. we've had a couple of these in the last uh, decade or so where the government will email, not email, but mail or send to the bank a check to people early giving them some money to spend hoping that that additional money will flow into the system and get the economy going again. Uh, the government could also cut taxes here, so make taxes a lot smaller, and that will leave more money in the system, uh, circulating around, getting the economy going again. So the government has a role, and we could add that into this circular flow. Another thing we could add is trade with foreign countries, and how does that affect the circular flow? I won't do that. I'll leave that up to your imagination. Now one last thing we can do here is, um, let me remove government here from our equation. One last thing we could do is we could add some numbers to this um, circular flow and we could try to imagine some relationships that have to happen. Now one relationship that economists uh, use when we calculate GDP, gross domestic product, we actually calculate gross domestic product two ways. One is to try to measure how much money is coming into households in wages, rent, interest, and profit. And that is called the income approach to calculating GDP. That's one way we do it. Now, why, why do it two ways? Well, because there's no way to accurately measure everything that's going on in an economy, right? It's just too big. It's too complex. So we, es we have to estimate GDP, basically. One way to estimate it is to try to add this up. How much did everybody earn in income, wages, rent, interest, and profits? Another way to try to um, measure gross domestic product is called the expenditure approach. We try to measure all the money spent by households on buying things. 
and so when I say things, I mean goods and services. That's called the expenditure pr approach to measuring GDP. So the idea is that what goes in must come out eventually. Um, now it's a little bit more complicated than that, but we're just getting a basic idea here of what's going on. So this is this is the um, again the circular flow model. Let me do a quick example with with a couple of numbers. Let's just suppose, for example, that um, when we were measuring GDP, the amount of money being spent, so the amount of money coming out of households. Now, of course, they could also save some money, but the amount of money we see coming out of households is, say, two hundred billion dollars. When we were calculating the other way, um, the income approach, suppose we observed instead that some of these pieces, here, let me move this down a little bit, suppose we observed uh, some of these pieces here for wages, rent, in interest, and profit, suppose we saw that wages were 80 billion dollars. Suppose we saw that rent was 20 billion dollars and we saw interest was 35 billion dollars. Then how much must profits be? Well, if we know that GDP was 200, then basically this amount earned in income has to equal 200 if we add it all up. So we're just asking, okay, well, 80 plus 20 plus 35 plus what has to equal 200. Well, in the missing number, I'm doing the calculation in my head here, profit would have to be 65 billion, right? So that's, that's another kind of simple exercise you can do with visualizing this circular flow. I'm going to end this video here, and as always, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to leave them on YouTube or to contact me by email and ask me questions that way. Good luck with your economic studies, guys!